Our next speaker is going to share an exciting breakthrough in materials that could help brighten smartphone screens, make batteries last longer and ultimately lower carbon footprints. Jessica Wade is a British physicist in the Blackett Laboratory at Imperial College London. Her research investigates polymer-based organic light-emitting diodes. She's also known for her extraordinary work championing women in STEM and physics and tackling the systemic bias in Wikipedia. Please welcome Jess Wade. Thank you so much, and I'm so thrilled and overwhelmed to be joining you today. I'm also really happy that amidst the lockdown and working from home, you've all found the time to join Word Live, and I hope you've had a really fantastic morning so far. So today I'm going to talk to you about three things that are really close to my heart. Printed electronics, chirality, and the intersection of chirality with technology. I work with carbon-based semiconductors which benefit from all of the electronic properties of things like silicon with the processing properties of carbon and plastics. That means I can take these materials, dissolve them in solvents like acetone or nail polish remover, acetone is nail polish remover, nail polish remover or water, and then turn them into these beautiful semiconducting inks where their electronic and optical properties depend on the chemical structure. That means that we can design molecules that will absorb and emit at particular colors of light. We can then take these semiconducting inks and print them onto any surface, which gives us a huge flexibility in the range of device applications. From flexible and bendy substrates to solar panels we can put in the sails of yachts to ultimately having a roll-up display. What's really fascinating about these materials is that they're often chiral, but we don't think to separate them or use their different chiral forms. I guess first I should tell you what chirality actually means. Chiral objects exist as non-superimposable mirror image pairs, like your left and your right hand. Chirality can exist across a range of different length scales, from the subatomic, so electrons, to the molecular and to macroscopic objects. You've probably noticed a bunch of chiral objects around your homes, like fusilli pasta and the helical screws you might have in your toolbox. <laughs> Actually, what you may not have noticed is 95% of those chiral structures these man-made chiral structures are right-handed. And no one knows why. A couple of years ago, a, a chemistry professor wrote to pasta companies suggesting that they turn their fusilli from being 95% right-handed to being 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed. And the reason that he proposed this was because if you had that, then the pastas would hold hands and your pasta bags could be more compressed. They'd be about 10% smaller. But that never took off, never actually took on. So there's room if you want to expand the pasta market. Larger still are the macroscopic chiral structures we see in nature, like the bark of wisteria trees. If you look really closely, you'll see that all Japanese wisteria twist clockwise, while all Chinese wisteria twist anti-clockwise. And still no one knows why this happens. While we now appreciate that chirality is pretty ubiquitous to all of biological life, it was only discovered in the last 150 years. For the world to understand the beauty of chiral molecules, we'd have to wait for a very important Frenchman to turn up. Louis Pasteur is best known for his work on vaccines and, of course, pasteurization. But long before he was playing around with pasteurization, he was looking in old wine barrels. And in these wine barrels, they formed these really, really beautiful crystals, these crystals of something called tartaric acid. And it was known at the time that tartaric acid did something very bizarre. If you pass plain polarized light through tartaric acid, so linearly polarized, where the electric field is oscillating in one plane, if you pass that through tartaric acid, then it would rotate the plane of polarization. What Pasteur noticed what the, was that these crystals in the wine barrels were non-superimposable mirror images of one another. They had the same physical properties, but differed in their ability to rotate this plain polarized light. And without even knowing the molecular structure of those molecules, and without even, he, he was about eight months out of finishing his PhD, Pasteur changed chemistry forever. Actually, this is a really cool fact. We think he managed to make this giant leap because of his training as an artist. Before Pasteur completed his science degree, he actually completed a fine art degree. And what he was really into was lithography. 
And in lithography, you etch out a drawing onto a slab of limestone and then you <clears throat> with wax, and then you press a paper on top of it to create a mirror image of the, the diagram or drawing that you've, you've drawn out. And so people have proposed that this is why Pasteur managed to make this incredible, extraordinary chemistry discovery. We now make use of chirality in a whole bunch of different industries, particularly in the fragrance industry. Molecules smell very different if they're the left or right handed form. This is carbon, the molecule that gives rise to the smell of spearmint and caraway, which smells very different if you have the left handed or the right handed version. Even in the pharmaceutical industry, we have to really think about the chirality of the drugs that we design. If you've got the left handed form of methamphetamine, you have an over the counter nasal decongestion. Whereas if you have the right handed form, you're either very happy in prison or both. <laughs> It's not only objects that are chiral, light can be chiral too. Thinking about chiral or circularly polarized light can get a little bit confusing. But what we like to think of it as in the physics world is two oscillating waves, which are equal in amplitude, but differ in phase by 90 degrees. When those waves come towards you, they look like they're tracing out a circle which can rotate left-handed or right-handed. Circularly polarized light pops up a lot in nature. If you look at the light that's reflected from the back of a beetle's shell, it comes back circularly polarized. And that's because of this beautiful polymer, this naturally occurring polymer called chitin. When chitin's inside these beetle shells, it ranges in something that liquid crystal people like to call a cholesteric stack, where each chain of the polymer, each backbone is like a rigid rod. And each layer of that stack is twisted a little bit with respect to the layer below. When light falls on that stack, it comes back to us circularly polarized. It comes back to us twisted. Now, our eyes can't detect circularly polarized light. To, so to see it, we have to use these 3D cinema glasses. And hopefully, this beautiful little animation will work. But you can see when you look through the right-handed lens, you can't see any of that beautiful, vivid color. Whereas if you look through the left-handed lens, which lets through left-handed light, you can see the really, really great circularly polarized reflectance from that beetle's shell. So here comes the best part. How will chiral materials transform technology? And I've actually spent the last few years trying to work on that exact question. It turns out there's a whole bunch of different applications from spintronics to high performance displays to detecting chiral biomolecules, encrypted communications, and even quantum optics. I'm gonna to talk to you briefly when I've stopped the phone from ringing about, magnetic, about, about a few of these different applications. Particularly, I'm going to focus on high performance displays because that's where I've put all my energy so far. At the moment, the most brilliant displays comprise of OLED pixels, organic light emitting diodes. As I mentioned in the introduction, these are materials that combine the electronic properties of silicon with the processing properties of carbon and plastics. And that's what the O in OLED means, organic. Now, if we didn't have an anti-glare filter in our OLEDs, we'd have a really big challenge. And I want to talk to you through why. At the moment, our OLEDs are comprised of this kind of device stack, this complicated sandwich-like structure. We have a back cover. We have a shiny electrode there where we inject our charges. We have the active layer. That's the part that emits light. And then we have a transparent conducting oxide on the top. If we didn't have an anti-glare filter, and you were standing outside trying to send a text message or watching television with someone with a light on behind you, that light would pass through that complex stack, hit off that electrode at the back, which as I mentioned is shiny, and come back to us and distort the image that we were getting. So we don't want that. We wanna have the highest resolution and the maximum contrast possible. So what we've done in display technology world is we've put this beautiful sophisticated filter there and what this filter does is it takes unpolarized light from behind us and turns it into chiral light. It turns it into circularly polarized light with a bunch of different optical components. So if we had this unpolarized light and it passes through our filter, it becomes left-handed. It becomes left-handed twisted light. Now what's incredible is when that left-handed twisted light hits off the electrode at the back, the handedness inverts. It goes from being left-handed to right-handed. And that means it can't get out of the anti-glare filter essentially we've trapped that annoying ambient light from behind us in the display which is great 
But it means that if our OLED pixels, which at the moment emit unpolarized light, which is 50% left-handed and 50% right-handed, if our OLED pixels are emitting that unpolarized light, then half of it won't be able to get through the display. Half of it can't pass through that anti-glare filter. So what we've proposed and other people have been looking at too is to create a circularly polarized OLED, an organic light emitting diode that will emit twisted light, it will emit fully left-handed light so it can bypass that anti-glare filter, have much, much more bright and efficient displays and ultimately increase the battery lifetime of things like our mobile phones. Now, this is a pretty difficult challenge and it's difficult because the materials I work with, the active layers of those OLEDs are made from polymers, these long disordered chains of things which don't like to form any kind of ordered structure and actually emit pretty unpolarized light. So the light coming out of these beautiful polymers is very bright. It's really, really beautiful when you put it in the display, but the light isn't polarized in any way. We know from a whole bunch of research in photovoltaics that if we cook these polymers at exactly the right temperature, we'll get them all to align in these beautiful rod-like structures, and then they emit linearly polarized light. So if we cook them perfectly, we get linearly polarized light. What's kind of fascinating and difficult is how we create these structures that will emit circularly polarized light. But the good part is I have spent the last few years perfecting this recipe for really strong chiral light emission. I've done a whole bunch of really fascinating investigations to work out the molecular structure of these things. And ultimately we've made beautiful, beautiful OLEDs where the thickness of the active layer is 300 times thinner than the human hair. So we've made these incredible structures, which ultimately will end up in your mobile phones one day. But what can chiral materials do beyond OLEDs? As I mentioned before, life is intrinsically chiral, from DNA to amino acids and heaps of different biomarkers. We're working on devices that use this chiral light to detect different chiral biomolecules, helping with the early diagnosis and prevention of diseases. Because our eyes can't tell whether light is chiral, our eyes can't differentiate circularly polarized light. We can use it for encrypted communications and potentially security tags. You'd only be able to see certain features if your detector knew that it was looking for left and right-handed light. There are so many cool applications, I could keep going. When we put super th thin films of our chiral materials inside a magnetic field and then pass plane polarized light through them, they rotate the plane of polarization by amount that's proportional to the thickness of our chiral layer and the magnetic field that it's passing through. That means we could use chiral materials to detect the super weak magnetic fields associated with neural communications in our brain, associated with when our brain sent electronic signals. That would transform functional neuroscience, where at the moment we have to use really bulky and expensive inorganic materials to do this imaging, making investigations really cumbersome and expensive. This is the coolest application though. Electrons don't only carry charge, as lots of you in this audience will know, but they also carry spin. Spin describes the angular momentum of an electron. We like to think of them in physics as rotating up and down. The combination of spin and electric charge means that electrons have magnetic dipole moments. When electrons move through a chiral system, they feel an effective magnetic field, which acts on those magnetic dipole moments such that when they move through this system, one spin is preferred over the other, depending on the chirality of the system that they're moving through. That means that transport, electron transport through chiral systems is directional. Spins of one direction will get blocked and filtered from traveling forward. Electrons in nature, in biology, travel through proteins, which are chiral. That's how we move energy and information around biological systems. The scientist who first proposed this technique in chiral molecules or this observation in chiral molecules believed that the effect might explain why biology is chiral anyway. A protein's chiral because this directional electron transfer is much, much more efficient than the inefficient electron transfer we get in things like metals. Right now, we're trying to use this spin selectivity to create electronic devices that make use of electron charge and spin. 
So I should end by saying that chiral materials are really great. We have extraordinarily strong light emission and absorption of circularly polarized light. We have these super interesting interactions with electric and magnetic fields. Spin polarized electron transport at room temperature will give us access to a whole range of new technologies and devices. And there is still so much that we need to learn. I wanted to end too by saying that the re reason that I found this research so fascinating is because of the people that I work with. Matthew Fuchter, who's a phenomenal synthetic chemist, and Alistair Campbell, a physicist at Imperial, and everyone who has made this research possible and, and quite extraordinary, really. Thank you so much for having me, and I look forward to questions.